Massachusetts Representative Joseph Walsh referred to them as the nagging of iron-jawed angels who were nothing more than bewildered, deluded creatures with short skirts and short hair. Why would an elected politician make such a derogatory comment towards women? Well, his comment was in reference to the force feeding of incarcerated suffragettes. The year was 1917. The House of Representatives just approved the creation of a House Committee on Women's Suffrage and Representative Walsh opposed this new committee. But on September 24, 1917, the debate was over and the vote was called. The roll was taken, the votes tallied, 181 voted for the committee, 107 voted against the committee. Now, although Representative Walsh's sentiments about women's suffrage were considered correct by a large portion of the electorate, meaning men only, nine Western states adopted women's suffrage at the state level. Janet Rankin, of Wyoming was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1916. She stated, suffragists can win the ballot where the state laws are reasonable, but in some places state laws form an insurmountable obstacle. Now it was that reason that Alice Paul broke with the National American Woman Suffrage Association and formed the National Women's Party. Now the National American Woman Suffrage Association wanted to gain suffrage state by state. Paul realized that certain states would make it impossible to give women the vote. She saw the only way for women to get the vote was a concentrated national effort to pass a constitutional amendment for women's suffrage. Now, Woodrow Wilson campaigned as a reformer during the 1912 presidential election. Many reform-minded groups supported Wilson's candidacy. During Wilson's first term, he did manage to pass a number of reforms, such as tariff reduction, direct election of senators. Uh, he created the Federal Reserve, strengthened antitrust laws, but he did segregate the federal government and he ignored women's suffrage. So those last two weren't reforms. They were more of regressive acts. Well, anyways, Wilson faced a tough re-election campaign in 1916. Now, his re-election campaign centered on how he kept the U.S. out of war. Wilson's re-election was close. He received 49.2% of the total vote. That would be about 9,126,000 votes, where Charles Evan Hughes received 46.1% of the total vote. That would be about 8,548,000 votes. Wilson was not a popular president. As a matter of fact, the evening edition of some newspapers stated Hughes had won the election. Now, unfortunately, just after the start of his second term, Wilson found himself declaring war on Germany and its allies. The U.S. was at war. Wilson suspended civil liberties. To criticize Wilson, the government, or the war effort would land a person in jail for treason. Now, that's exactly what happened to the silent sentence. They had the audacity to challenge President Wilson's stance on women's suffrage. And they did this by using his own words against him. As far as Wilson was concerned, this challenge by these women was almost sacrilegious. Wilson had been a PhD. He had been the president of Princeton University. He had been the successful reform governor of New Jersey. He was president of the United States during a world war. Those women were out of line as far as he was concerned. Now, the war between Wilson and the suffragettes started on March 3, 1913, when the National Women's Suffrage Association organized the largest political demonstration in Washington, D.C. Now, there was a significance to the date of March. You see, March 4th was Inauguration Day. Dignitaries from all over the country and the world would be in D.C. on that date. The parade was not as successful as the organizers had hoped for, but it was a shot across Wilson's bow, informing him that the issue of women's suffrage would not go away. Now, by 1916, the suffrage issue was coming to a boiling point. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns believed the National Americans Women's Suffrage Association policy of getting 
each state to pass legislation allowing women to vote was not going to work. Paul and Burns wanted a constitutional amendment. They called it the Anthony Amendment, and that protected women's rights in all the states. Now, these two women split from the NAWSA and formed the National Woman's Party. On January 9, 1917, Alice Paul and a deputation of suffragettes went to the White House to present President Wilson with a number of suffrage resolutions. Wilson refused to see him. Wilson's paternal arrogance was now showing. Now, they were going to show him because on the next day, January 10, 1917, the National Women's Party began picketing the White House. But unlike today, where picketers shout inane chants while marching and annoying people and obstructing traffic, but really not conveying their full message, the silent sentinels stood outside the White House and hung banners with President Roosevelt, I'm sorry, President Wilson's own words turned against him. Now, they didn't say a word. They didn't really obstruct traffic. These protesters were quickly dubbed the Silent Sentinels. Alice Paul was an astute political organizer. The women were instructed not to engage with the public if the public became hostile. In other words, don't get up in their faces of the people. Just stand there and peacefully protest by letting the banners speak for their cause. Now, many of the most effective banners carried quotes lifted directly from Wilson's own speeches. Parroting Wilson's words helped to highlight Wilson's hypocrisy in supporting democracy abroad while denying its women citizens the right to vote at home. Here's one of them. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Here's another. Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Another one. We shall fight for the things which we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own government. The time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there can be but one choice. We have made it. Here's a good one. Kaiser Wilson, have you forgotten your sympathies with the poor German because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your eyes, Mr. President. You say liberty is fundamental demand of the human spirit. Mr. President, you say we are interested in the United States, politically speaking, in nothing but human liberty. Anytime a foreign visitor or dignitary visited the White House, they were treated to a visual of women standing stoically outside the White House grounds, not saying a word. There were over 2,000 women in the National Women's Party. They protested every day from January 10, 1917 until June 4, 1919, when the Senate proposed the Amendment on Women's Suffrage. Now, during that time period, 500 of the protesters were arrested, 168 served jail time. Now, this brings me to the infamous Night of Terror. When the protest started in January of 1917, the United States was at peace the response of the public was mixed. Some approved of what the suffragists were doing, while others disapproved of the protest, and some people resorted to violence by tearing down the banners and destroying them. Wilson's reaction to the protest went from amusement to, oh boy, do I have a major problem on my hands now. It is alleged that on one occasion, he waved to the protesters from his car as he was returning uh, to the White House. Now, another story says he invited the protesters into the White House to have a cup of coffee. By this time, women had had it with Wilson. They refused. However, his attitude and the attitudes of the authorities would change once war had been declared. Now, in her oral history interview, Alice Paul stated our banners were really beautiful. The banners also sometimes inflamed onlookers and became targets of vandalism. The first of those famous Russian banners lasted less than a day. Pulled away from its bearer, it survived only a few minutes before the crowd shredded it to pieces. The same fate befell the Kaiser Wilson banner. It was the Russian banner that signaled an escalation between the suffragettes and the government. Now, the Russian banner in question stated to the Russian mission that was seeing Wilson that day, President Wilson and Envoy Root are deceiving Russia. They say, we are a democracy. Help us win world war so that democracies may survive. We, the women of America, tell you that America is not a democracy. 20 million American women are denied the right to vote. President Wilson is the chief opponent of their national enfranchisement. Help us make this nation really free. 
tell our government that it must liberate its people before it can claim free Russia as an ally. Inflamed onlookers was an understatement. The bearers of the Russian banner were Lucy Burns and Mrs. Lawrence Lewis, both of whom were on the executive board of the National Women's Party. They began June 20th, like any other day. They went to the NWP headquarters, received their orders for the day, picked up their banner, and headed to their post. Now, they were wearing the purple and white yellow colored sash of the NWP. Burns and Lewis made their way from national headquarters to the White House. That's just about a block away. At about 12.30 p.m., they unfurled their 10-foot banner. It was time to coincide with the arrival of the Russian dip diplomatic mission to the White House. Uh, the Russian diplomats really didn't have time to read the banner as their car sped through the White House gates. However, the banner did get the attention of the people on the streets. This was also time to coincide with government workers returning after lunch. Now, the June 20th edition of the Washington Times describes the reaction of the crowd. Almost immediately, however, a crowd gathered. Murmurs began spreading, and one man walked up to Miss Burns and said, Take down that sign, or I'm through with women's suffrage for life. The reaction of the crowd became more abusive. Cries of treason! It's an outrage! began to grow louder. One woman shouted to the suffragists, you are a friend to the enemy and a disgrace to your country. Ironically, the police at this time were not really trying to calm the crowd down. As a matter of fact, when Mr. Walter S. Timmons rushed up and tore the top half of the sign down, a police sergeant cried out to the crowd, Wait! Wait until I finish inscribing this. Now, the crowd didn't care. They were fired up and they wanted satisfaction. The banner was torn to shreds in seconds. Now, the sergeant and two army privates stationed inside the White House grounds were forced to protect Miss Burns and Mrs. Lewis. Both women stood there, brown though, clutching the now empty poles with the crowd continuing to yell. After 10 minutes, Burns and Lewis proudly made their way back to NWP's headquarters. Soon after, two more NWP members were in front of the White House with a new banner proclaiming, We demand democracy and self-government in our own land. The other banner asked the question, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Well, the official response from the White House was to say nothing. However, privately, many members of White House staff were indignant at the picketers' personal attack upon the President's character. Superintendent of Police Major Pullman met with Wilson's Secretary Tumulty to discuss ways of stopping the picketing. Now, the next incident happened the following day. The headline, the next incident happened the following day. The headlines on the front page of the Washington Evening Star for June 21, 1917 announced, Riding at the gates of the White House, one arrest made, large crowd assembles and tears down banner, displayed by suffragettes. Police woman pitches in without showing badge, goes to a clinch with Mrs. D. Richardson, leader in destruction of the banner. The suffragettes had the same wording on their sign as the day before, but this time Mrs. D. Richardson was a little more aggressive. She got into the suffragette's face and stated they were committing a treasonable act. She then grabbed the yellow banner and threw it on the ground. Before anybody could pick the banner up, Richardson retrieved the banner and with the help of her son, Harold, they tore the cloth into shreds. She then went back for another banner and tore it down. Again, with help from the crowd, the banner was torn to pieces. Now, it was probably at this point that Captain Sullivan of the D.C. Police put in the riot call. Soon, reserve police from several precincts were rushing to the scene. By now, Mrs. D. Richardson was the leader of this patriotic crowd. She stated, I will fight for my country and I will let no one stand in front of the White House and taunt our president with such treasonable sayings as have been printed on these banners. This is when all hell broke loose. Richardson went after the NWP sash that had been tied to the pole that had uh, held up one end of the now shredded banner. As she jumped, the female officer intervened. The paper reported the action this way. Instantly, a large woman grabbed her around the throat and throttled her, throwing her over the stone which stands in the pavement in front of the gates. It was Mrs. Farling, a policewoman. She wore no badge of authority. Richardson attempted to fight back when two DC policemen and a US Army officer jumped in to restrain Richardson. Now, once Richardson was restrained, one of the male officers told her rather quietly she was grappling with a policewoman, not a suffragette. Now, Richardson was arrested, but was quickly released without being charged. Now, with this riot, attitudes changed. Prominent men were calling for the arrest of the suffragettes. 
Dr. Anna Howard, Honorary President of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, stated, The picketing of the White House is the greatest obstacle now existing to the passage of the federal woman's suffrage. I'm sure there was an emergency meeting at the White House that night between Wilson, his secretary, Tumulty, and the superintendent of police, Pullman. I wonder what was said. I don't know. However, the next day, the gloves came off and the police went into action. So, they were in a desperate attempt. They had to end the picketing. Superintendent Pullman called the NWP headquarters at 9.30 on the morning of the 22nd. He spoke with Miss Alice Paul, the head of the NWP. He formally served notice that they had to stop their picketing of the White House or else. Now, to ensure the women of the NWP understood his intentions, Pullman ordered a line of policemen and policewomen to form along the one block route from the NWP's headquarters to the White House. After he issued his order, Pullman informed the press, the period of leniency has passed. Now, the major papers of the day describe the event. Lucy Burns and Catherine Moray left the NWP headquarters at about 9.45 a.m. carrying their new banner. They walked a short distance to the White House gate. When they began to unfurl their banner, three male D.C. police officers and two female D.C. Uh, police officers quickly surrounded the two suffragettes. Sergeant Lee told the women that their banner was confiscated and they had better keep moving if they wanted to pick it. Otherwise, they would be arrested. Now... Lucy Burns, an experienced activist, stood her ground and said, This banner is private property and we do not intend to give it up. Your position is illogical and unconstitutional, while our position is logical and constitutional. It was at this point, Policewoman Farling, hoping to defuse the situation, suggested to Miss Burns that it might be better, you know, just give up the banner and leave peacefully like that was going to happen. No way. Now, Miss Burns grasped the banner tightly to her body and defiantly announced, I'll submit to arrest first. With that, the minions of the law unburdened the ladies of their banner and formally arrested both of the women. Miss Burns and Moray were in front of Superintendent Pullman and Lieutenant Grant at police headquarters within minutes of their arrest. Now, Burns and Moray demanded to know what they were being charged with. Well, Lieutenant Grant said, well, let me see the banner, please. After viewing the banner, Lieutenant Grant quickly responded with Section 5, Peace and Order Act. And then Superintendent Pullman stepped forward and added, that'll be one of the charges anyways. So, what was Section 5 basically? Well, the two women were obstructing pedestrian traffic and causing a scene. The ordinance covered everything from street to public parks to sidewalks. It was basically a catch-all law. It was designed to stop any kind of protest in Washington, D.C., especially in front of the White House. Okay, so by this time, Miss Mabel Vernon, Miss Virginia Arnold, Mrs. Susan Morin entered police headquarters to support Miss Burns and Miss Moray. However, by this time, the excitement was over. Pullman released both women on their own recognizance. The women were unsuccessful in getting their banner back. Pullman declared the banner was evidence and could not be released. Now, Alice Paul sent out a statement to the newspaper stating all picketing of the White House was canceled for that day. Interestingly, when asked where she stood on the White House picketing, the only woman serving in the U.S. House of Representatives, Janet Rankin, stated, I'm deaf and dumb. That's a politician for you. Now, as the summer progressed, more arrests followed and longer prison sentences were handed down. They were jailed with common criminals, streetwalkers, and vagrants. The D.C. jails were unsanitary and dangerous. With more suffragettes being arrested, overcrowding became a problem in the D.C. jail. Now, it was the avowed mission of the National Women's Party to flood the D.C. jail with convicted picketers as a protest against the refusal of the Washington police to permit them to picket the White House. Perfectly legitimate tactic. Now, the first group of 16 suffragettes who were sent to the Oakland Workhouse in Virginia on July 18, 1917, almost one month after the first arrest, they were sentenced to 60 days in the workhouse where they were fined $25. They refused, they refused to pay the fine and the Wilson administration was determined to break the will of the suffragettes. And this is what the uh, July 20th edition of the New York Sun front page headline blared. Suffs accept pardon as a sign causes one. <laughs> 
what happened to change Wilson's mind? Well, the news article gives credit to a Mr. J. A. H. Hopkins, husband of one of the incarcerated suffragettes. The article stated Mr. Hopkins had a meeting with the president uh, the night of July 19th, and the conference with the president yesterday was largely responsible for their pardon. However, in her oral history interview with Alice Paul, now this was done between 1972 and 1973, historian Amelia Roberts Fry asked about the pardon, and Miss Paul gave an interesting answer. Now, the National Women's Party had engaged Dudley Field Malone to represent the jailed women. Four of those women were sent to the workhouse, were physically unfit to do 60 days of workhouse labor. Dudley Field Malone was a Democratic lawyer who had helped Wilson's primary win in New York in 1912 and to win the general election for president in 1912. Malone was also a supporter of the suffragette movement and he broke with Wilson in 1917. Malone was considered one of the prominent liberal attorneys in the U.S. at that time. Now, Wilson's decision to pardon the suffragette was most likely due to Malone and not Mr. J. A. H. Hopkins. I don't have any proof of that, but looking at the record. Okay, anyways, Malone was not done with the incident. The warden of Okaquan, Mr. Whitaker, informed the suffragettes upon their release that any woman who came back to this institution in the future as a result of suffrage trouble could not expect the consideration they had received. Malone declared Whitaker's statement as a threat and he was going to file charges against Warden Whitaker. The investigation was done, he was whitewashed, Whitaker was cleared, and basically he went back on the job as superintendent. Now, Wilson's damage control was not enough. July 22, 1917, the edition of the New York Sun wrote, Never before have 16 American women, women of refinement and social position, been committed to a penal institution set apart for the derelicts of a city. Never before have American mothers and wives endured such humiliation and punishment for a cause in which they believed. Wilson's campaign against the National Women's Party went into high gear. On October 21, 1917, Alice Paul, Gladys Grenier, and Dr. Caroline Spence and Gertrude Crocker were arrested for picketing in front of the White House. Again, they used Wilson's own words. On one of their banners, they stated, The time has come when we must either conquer or submit. There is but one question. We have made it. Now, the other banner stated, Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Now, they bonded out to await their hearing in police court on the next day. As usual, they were found guilty of blocking traffic and sentenced to 60 days at Okaquan. However, the suffragettes' new tactic was to refuse to work at the workhouse and therefore they were sent back to D.C. to serve their time. Alice Paul, Dr. Caroline Spence were given an additional 30 days for previous arrests. Now, the women were placed in solitary confinement to serve out their time. Alice Paul went on a hunger strike at this point to protest the bad food her companions were forced to eat. She was also denied communication with the outside world. The only information about Paul was smuggled out of the jail on scraps of paper. By now, Wilson is faced by now, Wilson is the face of the anti-suffrage movement. The government and the newspapers are referring to the National Women's Party as the militant arm of the suffrage movement. It's coming to a flashpoint. Wilson realized he needed to support women's suffrage, even though he disagreed with it. The November 10th article in the New York Sun reported that Wilson was in support of the state's granting suffrage, but was against the constitutional amendment. Carry Chapman Catt, the leader of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and Paul had split over the methods they should use to gain the vote. Catt believed in doing it state by state, while Paul believed in direct action and a constitutional amendment. However, the fuse was lit on November 10, 1917. Now, the NWP picketed the White House as usual on November 10, and the police arrested 41 suffragettes. On November 12th, they were brought before the police court to answer the charge of obstructing traffic. The November 14th edition of the Evening Capital News front page ran a, a small two-paragraph story with the headline, More Suffragettes Sent to the Workhouse. It was becoming common news about the women picketing and going to the workhouse. It was almost routine. However, while American citizens were reading this article, there was nothing routine about the reception the suffragettes received at the workhouse.
Now, the first the public read about the treatment was on November 17th. The New York Tribune and the New York Sun both published articles about the women's treatment. The Tribune published their story on page 16 with the headline, Jail Pickets, First a Fury, Then a Martyr, Free Statements of Both Sides, Breaking Out Windows, Was It for Air or Deviltry? The New York Sun story on, was on their front page with the headline, Lucy Burns was made fast to the bars, so she says. Now, the government was in full damage control. The women had been mistreated, and the government needed to have a plausible reason for that mistreatment. The problem was, the warden at Ogonquin, I'm sorry, Okaquan, refused to allow the women's attorney, Matthew O'Brien, access to his clients while in custody. Okay, that in and of itself raises questions about the government's accuracy of the events on November 14, 1917. Now, the New York Sun's article, again on the 17th, November 17th, detailed what happened to the imprisoned suffragettes upon their arrival at Okaquan. Now, first, the women demanded to see Superintendent Whitaker to give them their request. He refused. Miss Hendon's response was, well, then we're going to wait up all night. One of the prison guards responded, he would put them in a sardine box and cover them with mustard if they didn't shut up. Now, when Whitaker did arrive, approximately an hour later, he refused to listen to the women's demand and had the guards seize the women then drag them to the cells. Now Mrs. Minnie P. Quay, who was one of the prisoners, swore out an affidavit of the events of that night and in more specific detail. Quote, I arrived at Okaquan on the evening of November 14, 1917, after waiting about an hour in the office of the workhouse. The superintendent, Mr. Whitaker, arrived about 30 guards with him, suddenly seized our party and dragged us out of the room and into the darkness across the road some distance and then threw us into a dark dirty dungeon the dungeon was i was in was very filthy tobacco spit in the floor all along the sides of the filthy bunks dirty horse blankets open dirty toilets no water dark and damp i was so cold my teeth chattered all night superintendent whitaker ran up and down the corridor screaming to the guards to bring the handcuffs straight jackets and ball gags he threatened to put them on miss julia emery who was in the dungeon with me. They then opened the door of another dungeon and threw Miss Lucy Burns into her cell. Then they pulled her arms through the bars and handcuffed them there. The next morning I was taken to Superintendent Whitaker's office. He informed me he had a whipping post at Okaquan and that he would use it on the prisoners. He then sent me to the men's hospital where I remained for 10 days. Now the first three days I was fed on bread and filthy milk and something in it tasted like carbolic acid. Okay, now the New York Sun reported when Lucy Burns asked for counsel, Whitaker told her to shut up and threatened to use the straitjacket and ball gag, or button gag as they called it. Now on the same day, the New York Tribune reported that the women refused to wear the prison issue clothing, their clothing was torn from them, and the women were terrorized uh, by the brutality of the guards. Now, when O'Brien, their lawyer, was refused access to his clients by Whitaker, he went to Judge Mal. Malawi of the uh, police courts to have him issue a writ of habeas corpus. O'Brien reported to the newspapers the brutal treatment of his clients by Superintendent Whitaker. Now, Mrs. John Winters Brannon, the wife of the president of the Board of Trustees of Bellevue Hospital, who just so happened to be one of the suffragettes held at Okaquan Workhouse and was in the group of women prisoners who went through that night of terror, confirmed O'Brien's statement in the New York Tribune of November 29th. They were deliberately terrorized and almost killed by the officials. She then went on to list the methods used by Whitaker and his staff on the prisoners, such as being thrown repeatedly to the ground and picked up again and thrown down, or over a bench, threatened with the straitjackets and ball gangs. And if they talked with one another, they were threatened with being tied to the whipping post and being whipped. Now, they were force-fed, those were on hunger strike, the clothes were ripped from them, so they had to wear prison garb, they were dragged and thrown into and out of filthy cells, and these cells were filled with vermin and lice. This was now becoming a national embarrassment for President Wilson, and it was only going to get worse, something had to be done. After O'Brien consulted with his clients in Okaquan, he immediately went to the United States District Court in Richmond, Virginia, asking for rid of habeas corpus due to the alleged cruelty and on the fact that these prisoners sentenced for offenses committed in D.C. were serving their time in a state prison of Virginia. 
Judge Edmund Wardell Jr. issued the writ and ordered the prisoners to be in his courtroom on November 27th to show cause as to why they should not be released. In the November 23, 2020 Ms. Magazine article, David Dismore relates the event in Judge Wardell's courtroom. All but three of the prisoners were in the courtroom. Alice Paul was in the D.C. psych ward on a hunger strike. Lucy Burns and Dory Lewis had been transferred to the D.C. jail a few days earlier because they were the ringleaders. And of the female prisoners in the courtroom that day, all of them showed signs of mistreatment. The women who went on a hunger strike also showed signs of malnutrition. Judge Waddell was shocked at the sight of these women when they entered his courtroom. He became incensed when he was told three of the women were too ill to attend the hearing. Now the government was on the losing end of this case and they were just making it worse. After hearing the evidence, Judge Waddell ruled that the woman could not be held in Virginia jails for breaking laws in the District of Columbia. The following day, November 24th, the judge would hear the testimony about the treatment of the women while in custody. Now, Wilson was boxed in, and he had no choice but to issue a presidential pardon. On November 27th, half the women were released from custody, and by November 28th, all the women were released. Wilson had lost his battle with the National Woman's Party. The most damning indictment against Wilson's anti-suffrage campaign was given by suffragette Mrs. Brannon. Quote, if proof is needed that the administration is behind this outrageous attempt to suppress our campaign, it can be found in the following fact. Superintendent Whitaker said, if you promise not to pick it again, I will release you at once. I will take you back to Washington in my own car and you need not pay your fine. Okay, so a lawsuit was filed December 3rd, 1918 against the District of Columbia, Superintendent Whitaker and Warden Zinkham for $400,000 in damages for the treatment they received while in custody. Whitaker quietly resigned his post shortly after the suit was filed. The DC commissioners were forced to remove Warden Zinkham because he wouldn't resign, so he was kicked out of his post as warden of the DC jail. The women eventually, though, had to drop the case. They stood little chance of winning. Now, Superintendent Whitaker would die in the 1920, never having to take responsibility for his action. President Wilson was facing a difficult midterm election in 1918, and with the silent sentinels continuing to protest, Wilson had no choice but to support the federal amendment for women's voting rights. Now, the 19th Amendment was ratified on August 18, 1919, when Tennessee voted yay, giving the two-thirds required. Now, if you'd like to know more about the silent sentinels, because there is a whole lot more out there, in the suffragette movement, I placed links in the description to Alice Paul's website in the online Google book, Jail for Freedom by Doris Stevens, and the story of the Women's Party by Inez Haynes Irwin. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and leave a comment below. Most importantly, share this video with your friends. As always, thank you for watching.